The new British colony was practically a desert island. It had once had a considerable population who had supported themselves by successful piracy, but an expedition from Kedah had banished them about the year 1750, and in 1786, with the exception of a very few clearings, one of which, containing a burial ground, was at Dato Kramet. The island was one vast jungle of nearly 107 square miles, with a population of only 58 souls. Captain Light had with him three vessels, the Eliza, the Prince Henry, and the Speedwell Snow. A hundred Bengal new-made marines, 30 native Lascars, and 15 European artillerymen with five officers to give him their support. And on the 17th of July, 1786, having provisioned his force previously during the negotiations at Kedah, he, as we have seen, landed with his force at Penang. It was no simple matter for him to commence. The first salutary rules issued were that no Malay armed with a kris was allowed ashore, and that the Achenese pirates by whom so many European forts had been cut off in former times were kept from landing. The impenetrable forests had to be cleared, no easy task, and Captain Light enters in his diary on July 29th. In cutting the trees, our axes, hatches, and hand bolts suffer much. The wood is so exceeding hard that the tools double like a piece of lead. A curious story is told that Captain Light encouraged the woodcutters to clear the jungle by loading a gun with a bag of silver dollars and firing it into the virgin forest. A town afterwards called Georgetown was speedily built, and the roads made towards the center of the island. By the 10th of August, certain advances had been made, and two of the East India Company's ships, the Vansittart and the Valentine, appearing off the coast, Captain Light thought it a suitable occasion to invite their captains and crews to assist to christen the new colony. This was done on the 11th of August. At noon, he writes, we all assembled under the flag staff, every gentleman assisting to hoist the British flag, and took possession of the island in the name of His Majesty George III. And for the use of the Honorable East India Company, the artillery and ships firing a royal salute and the Marines three volleys, I named our new acquisition after the Prince of Wales, it being the eve of his birthday, the 12th of August. The act of possession was as follows. These are to certify that agreeable to my orders and instructions from the Honorable Governor General and Council of Bengal, I have this day taken possession of this island called Pulu Penang, now named Prince of Wales Island, and hoisted the British colors in the name of His Majesty George III, and for the use of the Honorable English East India Company, the 11th day of August, 1786, being the eve of the Prince of Wales's birthday. Signed, Francis Light, SPI, James Gray, Lieutenant, Commandant, Marine Corps, in presence of the underwritten. George Howell, Captain Artillery, Elisha Tripod, Captain Engineers, Richard Lewin, Commander of the Honorable Company's Ship Vansittart, John Beetson, George Smith, Merchant, Thos Wall, Commander of the Honorable Company's Ship Valentine, David Pria, Captain 84th Regiment, Joseph McGinnis, Surgeon of the Honorable Company's Ship Valentine, Jas Glass, Commander of the Prince Henry Storeship, William Lindsay, Commander of the Snow Speedwell, Jas Holcomb, First Lieutenant of the Honorable Company Snow Eliza. Captain Light writes to Mr. John Ferguson three months later, Our inhabitants increase very fast. Chuliars, Chinese, and Christians. They are already disputing about the ground, everyone building as fast as they can. The French Padre from Kedah has erected his cross here, and in two months more it will never be believed that this place was never before inhabited. But it was no light matter to govern the newcomers, and beyond an informal court-martial, the whole exercise of the judicial power fell upon Captain Light as superintendent, assisted only by the captains or leaders of the different nationalities of the island. That it was wisely used is shown by the fact that in 1789 there were already about 10,000 inhabitants, and in 1795 about 20,000, including 3,000 Chinese whose compatriots would have flocked to the new shelter in even greater numbers had not the jealousy of the Dutch restrained them from leaving Malacca, by means which the superintendent writes in February 1787 in a letter to his friend Mr. Andrew Ross of Madras would dishonor any but a Dutchman. Captain Light dreaded in the midst of all the international jealousies to which the new settlement was exposed, lest an attack from pirates or by the Malays or Siamese should frighten the settlers away, and as soon as possible built a fort of Nibon palms with which he might be able to protect 
the new capital. The little support given to Captain Light in his desire to establish proper tribunals and courts of justice in Penang was caused by the jealous eye with which a certain party of the Bengal officials regarded his colony. They protected a rival settlement in the Andamans, which founded in 1791, emulated and tried to supplant Penang for a few years, but was abandoned in 1796, while the older colony overcame its difficulties and flourished. Having narrated the real history of the British settlement, it seems necessary to mention here the romantic story which has become an undying legend, that Captain Light received Penang as a marriage portion with the daughter of the King of Kedah, a legend which we are assured was fondly cherished by his descendants. John Crawford, in 1820, denies the story utterly and asserts that the wife of the enterprising adventurer was neither a princess nor a Malay, but was instead a Portuguese of Siam. We must, however, put this direct denial against the opposing statements of two contemporaries. One of them, William Marsden, the learned historian of Sumatra, states that she was a daughter of the King of Kedah, the other, Captain Elisha Trapod, himself one of the Penang pioneer settlers, whose sketch of the ceremony of christening Prince of Wales Island has been in part reproduced to illustrate this memoir, writes in 1788, he, Captain Light, had assisted the above Prince of Kedah in quelling some troubles in his dominions, who in return bestowed upon him a princess of the blood in marriage, together with this island as her dower. Captain Light, who is extremely well beloved amongst the Malays, chose to marry the princess according to the fashions of her own country. And he proceeds to give a long, interesting, and curious description of the Malay wedding ceremonies. The lady in question is shown by Captain Light's will, at any rate, to have borne the Portuguese name of Martina Rosels. She bore him two sons and three daughters, and at his death he left her much real and personal estate. And the Penang administrations show that she survived him at least until 1822. 